Amen. If you'll turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 6. If you do not have a copy of God's Word, there is one in front of you. You can turn to page 862. I encourage you to keep open God's Word to see that these things truly are God's Word to you. This morning, from the Gospel of Luke, we'll begin reading in verse 17. And he came down with them and stood on a level place with a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea and Jerusalem and the seacoast of Tyre and Sidon who came to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. And those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured. And all the crowd sought to touch him for power came out from him and healed them all. And he lifted up his eyes on his disciples and said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you shall be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you and when they exclude you and revile you and spurn your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day. Leap for joy. Behold, your reward is great in heaven, for so their fathers did to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you shall be hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Woe to you when all people speak well of you, for so their fathers did to the false prophets. Thus far the reading of God's holy word. You may be seated. I grew up in a family where rarely we would go out to eat, and most of our meals were cooked at home. And so this forced me to know my way around the kitchen. If I wanted to eat, I needed to know how to cook. And that is a good life skill for all, and I'm thankful that my mother patiently taught me along the way. Cooking was a way of necessity, a means to an end. But I also quickly learned that baking, baking was the way of true pleasure. (laughs) Because of the end result, cookies and cakes and brownies. Sugary confections were the way of happiness. Those warm cookies and those freshly made cakes and brownies were true glory. So growing up, I was an okay cook, but a really good baker. (laughs) And if that is you, then you know that there's a few tricks of the trade. One of the things that you must know if you're going to make a cake is that you better grease your pan. And you better grease it with more oil than an oily sunbather on the beaches of Florida. (laughs) Butter, oil, Crisco, grease that thing. Because otherwise, when you go to flip that cake, it's not going to come out right. Or even worse, it will only half come out, and the other half will still be left in the pan. And when that happens, there is no recovery. It does not matter how much frosting you put on it, it's not going to look right. <laughs> but when you do it, when you make that flip, and, and you have to do that right as well, but when you lift up that pan and you see this perfectly formed cake, it's a thing of beauty. I think angels begin to sing the hallelujah chorus. Why am I saying all of this? Well, if you think about it, all cake, all cake worth eating is cake that is enjoyed upside down. It's baked one way, but when it's ready, it's flipped upside down. And I say that because this passage before us teaches us, I think, that the kingdom of heaven is like that piece of cake. It's best enjoyed upside down opposite of what you would think, opposite of what the world would tell you. It bucks conventional wisdom. It turns your view of the world 
upside down in what we'll see in reality is really right side up. And when it does happen, when we do, or better yet, when Christ does it for us, that is where we find true enjoyment, true joy. That is what we see this morning in Jesus' teaching. Life is best enjoyed upside down. It is the way of blessing instead of the way of woe. And when it is seen from that perspective, it is different, yes, but oh, so much better and greater. We'll see that in two points this morning, the way of to Christ and the way of fulfillment. The way to Christ. You might remember, but most likely not, that four years ago I taught the entirety of the Sermon of the Mount in Matthew 5 through 7. It was a 32 sermon series. Took over not quite a, a half a year, a little bit, actually a little bit more than a half a year. And you might be encouraged that this morning it will not take us 32 sermons to go through Luke's Sermon on the Mount because that is what is here. What takes Matthew three chapters, Luke does in about 30 verses. And now some have speculated that this is a separate teaching, a similar context, but a, 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 a different setting altogether. And even some call this the, the Sermon on the Plain to differentiate it from the Sermon on the Mount. And that is because in verse 17 it says that when he came down, he stood with him on a level place. That word can be translated plain. But as tempting as it is for me as a preacher to believe that Jesus also recycled sermons, I do believe that this teaching is one and the same. That Matthew's is... The fuller sermon and Luke's a little more compact. And perhaps that is because Matthew was there when the Sermon of the Mount was given. And perhaps he was even transcribing it while it was preached. Whereas Luke was most likely not there. He had to rely upon eyewitness accounts. He needed to get a summary report of the sermon. So the difference would be the difference between listening to a recording of the sermon, basically what you have in Matthew, or versus what you have in Luke was someone telling what the sermon was about. Both are the same events, but one is going to be longer and the other quite a bit shorter, quite a bit more succinct. And I think that is what you have here in Luke 6. But before we get actually into the sermon that is preached, and we will be looking at it the next several weeks, we need to see how Luke introduces this teaching. You see that there in verses 17 through 19, that after Jesus has chosen his disciples, the public ministry of Jesus begins to grow, and it, it grows quite rapidly. In fact, you must hear what Luke is saying. He is making quite an emphasis on that. It says, with, he stood on a level pl place with a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people. You hear that double aspect, a, a great crowd and a great multitude. That this wasn't just one or two or even a few hundred or even a few thousands. This was tens of thousands so much so that I think Luke is saying it would be difficult to count how many were coming to Christ. And it wasn't just one type of person from one certain area. Luke makes it very evident that this was a very diverse group from all over. He talks about them coming from Judea and Jerusalem. In other words, from the south. And most likely most of them were, were Jewish and then he talks about those coming from the, the west, from the seacoast of Tyre and Sidon. And, and most likely that would have been mainly Gentiles. And you see that Luke is saying that there's Judeans and Galileans. There is Jews and Greeks, Jews and Gentiles. 
No doubt old and young, men and women, boys and girls, people of different cultures and ethnicities, all converging into this one place. For what reason? Well, simply to see and to hear Jesus. And that might be rather obvious, but that is a point that I think should not be missed. What was the reason for such an eclectic group to gather? It was, it was Christ. They came to him to, to hear him. They came to him to, to be healed. And you see some of those healings there in verse 18 and 19. In other words, these were people that recognized that they had a need. And they looked to Jesus to find that solution. And indeed, Jesus was that solution. And I ask you, is it any different today? As you look around like a gathering like this, at who's in this building? Don't take this the wrong way. But you are a very different bunch in a good way. That there is more differences than there are similarities. But what is the one similarity? What is the great uniter in this gathering or any gathering like this? It's all for one reason. It's gathering around the Lord Jesus Christ. It's gathering around the solution. It's recognizing that we are people that have a need and that need is only fulfilled in Christ. And so this church is a small microcosm of what is going on on the global stage this day. There's brothers and sisters from, from the north and the south and the east and the west, from North America and South America and Africa and Asia and all around the world are gathering around the Lord Jesus Christ. And humanly speaking, we have nothing in common except Christ. Yet in Christ, we have the greatest thing in common. As we come as needy, needy people, I have found the, the one true, everlasting answer. And that is the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ is what draws us. It's what attracts us. It's what brings us together. And it is a, a beautiful thing. And as I mentioned, not just a few, but many a great crowd, a, a great multitude, just like in Jesus' day. And that number ought to be always growing. And I think that is a good correction for us. Oftentimes we have a tendency, especially in our circles, to say something like this. Well, it's, it's not about the numbers. That is true in one sense. Numbers do not always equate to a right ministry, nor should we desire to have a growing ministry to, to make much of ourselves. If that's what you mean by that, then you are right. It is not about the numbers. But if you are saying it's not about the numbers in the sense that we should not think that the kingdom of God should be expanding and growing, but actually in some ways maybe even the opposite, shrinking and becoming smaller, then what I think we would have to hear is that we do not have the perspective of God. Nor are we trusting him to do the work that truly amazes us. Again, in, in reform circles, let's point the finger at ourselves. We have this tendency to say, or perhaps not say, but perhaps think, that if we're going to be doctrinally pure, that pure and pure means fewer and fewer. Or only for, no more, shut the door. And if we have a small church mentality, then we are going to think in small ways. And in fact, we're going to believe and trust in small ways. And that's not to say that we should have a big church mentality either, but we should have a big God mentality that works and labors and prays with that perspective that God is indeed at work. And not just out there somewhere in the far reaches of, of Africa and Asia and China and South Korea and North Korea. But here in this place, with our family, 
in our neighborhoods and in our workplace. The God that says that the fields are white unto harvest, he's not just talking about faraway places, he's talking about right around us. And therefore, we should have this desire, we should even have this expectation that, that the ministry, the ministry of this church would produce 30, 60, 100 fold of what is planted and what is sowed. And so we should not think, what, well, what, what we have here is, well, it's just for a select few. And, and most probably won't want it. If what we have here is just a, a comfortable social circle, you are right. Most will not want that more than they want you or want me. But if what we have here is Christ, then that is what all want. And if they don't all want it, it is what they all need, if they know it or not. The common need in Jesus' day is the, the same need today. We are not different people, are we? We may have different circumstances. We may be in a different culture. Yes, this may be the 21st century, but the human need is still the same, and that need is for Christ. And it is Christ that we find our all and all. And so this passage, really the entirety of the New Testament, should, should make us repent of our small-mindedness, which in reality is faithlessness that the Lord can do and will do abundantly more than we ask or even imagine here and now in this place through you and through me, so much so that we should be continually surprised, right? Surprised at what God is doing and is able to do when we work and we labor and we pray because God is not a God of addition. He's a God of multiplication, that the same Jesus that took five loaves and two fish and fed 5,000 can take our small, meager works, our small offerings that we give to him through our gifts and through our talents, through our tithes, and do far more, far greater if we dream and we pray and we work with that expectation and that anticipation and do not do so in despair. Well, that is the way to Christ and really the way of Christ. But then we go on to see Jesus teaching. What is it that he wants to teach this great crowd, this great multitude? Well, I think it is the way of fulfillment. As they gather, he begins to teach. And notice it says that, he lifted up his eyes, verse 20, on his disciples. Now, this isn't just the, the 12 disciples. This is a multitude of disciples, a great crowd of disciples, those that were his followers and students. Some were true disciples, no doubt. Some were false disciples, which is still the case even today. But Jesus wants to teach his disciples what life in the kingdom of God truly is. Life is a follower of his. And what is amazing, once again, is that what is true for them is still true for us 2,000 years ago. That this is the timeless truth of an eternal God. That this comes from the creator of us all, the, the one who knows us better than we know ourselves. And so we better pay attention, right? We better give heed. We better listen. And he begins with, probably one of his most famous teachings known as the Beatitudes. Again, Luke's list is not as long as Matthew's list. Luke gives a summary of the Beatitudes. If you want the full list, you can go to Matthew chapter 5. And each and every one of them is a, a beautiful truth in and of themselves and they demonstrate a, a progression now, we don't have time to go through each and every one of these Beatitudes in depth. If you desire that, then I'd refer you back to those sermons several years ago in Matthew 5. But a few observations can be made this morning. First of all, you see that they begin with that same word. In fact, two words. The, the first set is begins with, with blessing, blessed. 
You see that four times. Blessed, 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 blessed. It comes from that, well, translated that Latin word beatitus, where we get the word beatitude from. And then conversely, you have a set of four woes. And so he's laying it out very clear for us. This is the way of blessing. This is the way of woe or the way of cursing. That this is the state of blessing that you want to be. And blessing is a state of being. It is a holistic blessing of heart and mind and soul and life. A blessing that comes not from within but from above. What I think Jesus is saying that this is the blessing of God that is given in the context of the covenant. That this is a covenant designation. To be blessed is a state of blessing. It's a a state of possession. Again, not because of us, but because of God, the one who blesses us. It comes from being called out by God to be brought out of the world and brought into this special state, this state of belonging to him, belonging to the people of God. That we are made a a heavenly kingdom and a heavenly citizen of that kingdom. I liken it to traveling internationally And perhaps you've had this experience where you come back into the States and you have to go through customs. And it's a very clear delineation. U.S. citizens this way, foreigners that way. And what happens if you are a U.S. citizen and you have that blue passport with the the golden eagle on the front? Well, you kind of just whiz right on through customs, right? Short lines, whereas the foreigner, they, they have a lot more questions to answer. If you are a foreigner, you you know that all too well. Or it's perhaps like the Delta Club interests at the Braves game. There's a, don't know if you knew this, there's a separate gate, a separate entrance. You get to bypass all the crowds. And once in, you, you get all the food and all the drinks and you get prime seats. Why? All because you are wearing that, that special lanyard It says Delta Club ticket holder. Now, I've I've only had that privilege once, so don't think that's how I always roll when I go to the Braves games, believe me. But if that is how you do roll, remember your pastors. (laughs) Or if you only have one ticket, remember your pastor, senior pastor. But it is a a special designation. It is a a special privilege. It's a a state of a blessing. That's what this is talking about. That this person that is blessed is in this state, is in this realm. But that is where the similarities stop. Because you might think that the, the blessed life is how the world would define blessing. A life of luxury and of ease of riches, of privilege. But Jesus has something very different in mind, doesn't he? Look at what he says. Blessed are the poor, the hungry, those that weep. Blessed are those when when people hate you, exclude you, revile you, spurn your name as evil. You should read that and you should go, hold up, Jesus. Jesus. I don't know what you think the blessed life is, but that sure doesn't seem like it. That is very different than what the world would tell us. And so these words should jar us because they are the exact opposite. We would think it should say, blessed are the rich. Blessed are those that are, that are always full and, and never lack. Blessed are those that are, are full of laughter. Blessed are those that that are loved by everyone and and by all. And yet what is extremely scary about this passage is when we flip the page, at least in my Bible, verses 24 and verse 26, he actually says, no, that's the way of cursing. That's the way of woe. In fact, that's the way of, of death. 
And so if you do not grasp the radical nature of Jesus' teaching, I know it's very familiar to us. I know we've heard these Beatitudes many times before, but, but if we don't understand the radical nature of the kingdom of God, then you're either not listening or not paying attention. This should smack us between the eyes. And in fact, we should say, well, if that's the way of Christ, then I'm not quite sure I want it. Because this goes so antithetical to my natural senses. We should say nobody, nobody would want poverty, hunger, weeping, hating. If that's your natural reaction, then you're understanding it rightly. So, so what gives? What is Jesus saying? Well, I think Jesus uses physical realities to speak of greater underlying spiritual truths. He uses money and food and emotions and relationships, all things that, that we know so well, things that are very much real. Money is real, right? Food is tangible. Tears and, and laughter, emotions are, are things that, that we can see. Relationships, love and hatred are something that, that we can feel. But as real as those are, so real, so tangible are the spiritual realities of the kingdom of heaven. And I would go even as far as to say the spiritual kingdom is, is more real. It's more of a reality than the things that we see with our eyes and that we can touch and that we can feel. Jesus is saying that the blessed person is the person that realizes that, that lives in that spiritual kingdom, that pursues the spiritual realities more than the physical ones. That is the state of blessing. That is the way of life. But woe to the person that thinks that this present world is all that there is. That which we see, that which we can attain, that which we can grasp hold of is all that life is about. Him who gains the most toys is he or she that wins. Jesus is saying that state, that way is the way of cursing and of death. And what Jesus does in this teaching this hits on a fundamental nerve of all humanity. It's that search for significance. It's that need for substance. Something that is, is lasting. Because each and every one of us feel that there is something missing. Something that is not right. That is, that is out of place. That is out of kilter. That, that we are not complete. We are not whole. And what usually happens is that we search and search and we think, this is what I need. This is what's going to fulfill me. This is what's going to make me whole. This is what's going to make me complete. And guess what? It makes us happy for a time. But then what happens? Quickly wears off. And that search, that cycle that gerbil wheel eventually makes us exhausted. And in reality, it makes us worse off than at first. And Jesus is very clearly saying in this teaching is because we are searching in the wrong place. We're looking in the physical realm. We're thinking that money and riches and possession and food and drink and sex and relationship and entertainment and laughter will be the way of blessing the way of completion, the way of wholeness, the way of fulfillment. And none of it does, does it? If it did, the blessed of this world, those that have everything, would be the happiest and most content of all. And yet, what do we see? That they are typically the worst off and the most miserable. I was talking with one of our members recently he was heartbroken because he went into his boss's office, a man who is a, a millionaire many times over. If I mentioned his name, you've probably heard of it. And yet in his office, he had a book 
on his desk that it was entitled, When All You Ever Wanted Is Not Enough. When all you ever wanted is not enough. And it never is enough, is it? It was never meant to be. And Jesus is pressing in on that nerve. He's saying you are searching down the wrong road. A road that is a dead end. A a road that is only going to lead you to emptiness and loneliness. And that is not just the teaching of Jesus, is it? We can go all the way back to the preacher in Ecclesiastes who says, vanity, vanity. All is vanity. It is a, a chasing after the wind. That it's like a, a vapor that seems to have substance, but when you try to, to grab hold of it, you see that there is nothing there. It is of no substance. And therefore, we need to look, we need to have eyes, eyes of faith that look in a, a different realm. But how do we do so? How do we live in this world with its present surroundings? How do we work in this world that, that is driven by all of these earthly things? But yet we have a pursuit of a different world, a different realm, a different kingdom. Well, Jesus is telling us, isn't he? And if you even just recognize that, then I think you are well on a way. You're well along on this path to true fulfillment, to true satisfaction. I remember Jesus said something similar when a scribe came to him. And the scribe responded to Jesus' statement by saying, to love God with all your heart and with all your understanding and with all your strength and to love one neighbor as yourself is much more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. And I love what Jesus says to this man. He says when he saw that he answered wisely, Jesus said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. Why? Because this man was seeing what he says in this passage, that we need to look beyond the the physical realm. We need to even look beyond the sacrifices and the offerings to the, the love of God and the worship of God. That that spiritual reality is so much greater than our physical world. Now, don't get me wrong. Jesus is not saying that the the physical does not matter. That the physical is anti-spiritual. That this world does not matter. We do not want to be Gnostics that think that the physical is bad and the spiritual is good. But I think what Jesus is saying is you need to understand the order. That the order is very important. That you have to seek after the spiritual things and the spiritual things put in the right context and order the physical things. How we should view this world. Look back at these beatitudes with me. When he says, blessed are you who are rich, for yours is the kingdom of God. Is, Is Jesus really talking about riches or money? No, what he's saying is it's not either wealth or poverty, that none of those things will will gain you entrance into the kingdom of heaven. But rather what Matthew says, that you need to be poor in spirit. Do you recognize it does not come from within or from without, but from above? Again, blessed are those who are hungry now, for you shall be satisfied. That the satisfaction in Christ is not the, the gratification of the flesh, but it's provided through the fulfillment that only God can give. Again, blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. You, you need to weep over your sins. And that's the only way that you'll find true laughter, true joy. Again, it does not come in, in having all love you, but rather having Christ love you. And, and not pleasing men, but, but pleasing Christ. That that is the way of, of blessing. Do you see, if you, you understand the spiritual realities, that puts the, the physical realities in their right place, their right context. That the riches and the fulfillment and the pleasure and the joy and the laughter and the sorrow are all given their right perspective. Because none of those things are ultimate. None of those things are the things that define 
our life. Think of it this way. Does God treat you differently on the basis of how much money you have in the bank? How much food is in your refrigerator? What position you have at work? Or how many friends and social acquaintances and, and, and quote-unquote friends that follow you on social media? No. And if God does not see you that way, then why do we? Why would we try to define our worth, our worthiness on the basis of those things? Because those things will come and go, won't they? But the, the constant, that is Christ, will remain the same. That he's the one that's the same yesterday, today, and forever. That he is the path, the way of true blessing. That he is true riches, true fulfillment, true pleasure. And if he calls you blessed, it doesn't matter if the world calls you cursed or even curses at you. Because life in Christ is the blessed life in the blessed way. And Christ is more real and more meaningful than your present reality. Jesus says, blessed are you because your blessing is in me. But again, if you reverse that order and pursue after riches and things and stuff, your life, your success, your circumstances become ultimate and they ultimately become your master and become your Lord. And you may get them, you may attain them. But that is all you gain. That's all you attain. And there is nothing more. There's nothing more heart-wrenching than to struggle and fight to attain the top of the ladder only to get there and realize that there is nothing there. It's as dis satisfying as the bottom of the ladder. And what Jesus is saying is don't pursue after that. Don't get on that path. See, Jesus is, is really teaching the same thing that Psalm 1 teaches us. That Psalm that we confessed earlier in the service, that the, the blessed man is Christ and the blessed life is in Christ and the blessed man and woman pursues after Christ that they are the tree planted by streams of water to bear its fruit in season, whose leaf does not wither. Do you notice that? That the, the circumstances, the seasons are always changing, but this tree is not. Why? Because its roots go down deep. It's planted by streams of water. It's found the place where its thirst is quenched, that is quenched in God alone. So let me ask you this morning, how about you? How about you? Are the spiritual realities, these things unseen, the things of Christ and of God, are these the things that you're pursuing after? The very thing that we do this morning, is this more of a, a reality than what we can touch and that which we can taste and that which we can feel, that this reality, this is the world as it really is. See, we don't put life on hold to come and just do our, our churchy thing. How do we understand this is life? This is the world. This is the creation rightly ordered. When we're worshiping our God as redeemed creatures, that's what God created this world for. The world out there is, is wrongly ordered. It has a wrong perspective. This is where it is rightly ordered. This is life upside down, or when we see it correctly, it's actually right side up. But it feels upside down because we've spent so much time in the world pursuing after these things. Where up is down and down is up. But God in Christ rightly flips our worldview to see things are right, to see things from this spiritual perspective. We walk by faith and not by sight. Is that how your life is characterized? by pursuing after these spiritual realities. That's what Jesus will say later on in the Sermon on the Mount and the one that Matthew gives when he says, therefore do not worry about what we shall eat or what we shall drink or what shall we wear. Listen to this, for the pagans run after those things. 
Your heavenly Father knows that you need them, but you, you seek first his kingdom, his righteousness, and all these other things will be given to you as well. So are we kingdom seekers, kingdom pursuers? Are we living as kingdom citizens? Yes, in this world, but seeing a world far beyond, far greater. Or are we like what Jesus is, like the pagans, like the world that runs after all the same things that they do? If our eyes are open to it, it opens us up to a brand new world, the world of Christ and the way of blessing. Let me just finish with this. What should our reaction be? If your eyes are open to this spiritual reality or if your eyes are being opened to this spiritual reality, well, I think Jesus gives the payoff right there in verse 23, right in the middle of this passage when he says, rejoice in that day and leap for joy. For behold, your reward is great in heaven. What should our reaction be? It should be rejoicing. When? Now. Now. The day that your eyes are open to this reality, when you live your life from this perspective, then we should rejoice and we should be glad. And in fact, it says that we should leap for joy. Can Presbyterians jump? I hope so. Because it says we should be leaping for joy because of what he has done and is doing in our life. And even then he goes on to say, and that's just the beginning. It only gets better. It only gets greater because he says, great is your reward in heaven. The pursuit of the upside down kingdom of Christ is the way of blessing, both in this life as well as the one to come. And so that means in Christ that you truly can have your cake and eat it too. Amen. Join me in prayer. Our gracious God and Heavenly Father, we thank you. Lord, we could never plummet the depths of this teaching. It is so succinct and yet it is so rich, it is so deep that a child can understand it and yet an elephant could drown in its depths. That is the reality of your kingdom, O Lord. And we pray that you would make us kingdom citizens, that we would see life from this spiritual perspective and not just this physical one. And Lord, we want to confess this morning, way too often we see things only from a physical reality, that which we can see and touch and feel. And we don't see things from the the spiritual reality, the eternal reality, the kingdom It comes from above. So, Lord, would you give us that heavenly perspective today? Would you allow us in part to see how you see this world and even our individual life so that, oh, Lord, we would see it aright and live in the way of blessing? And indeed, Lord, you would see us and that we would be blessed. And if we are in Christ this morning, that is our true reality. And we praise you for it. Would we see that way of blessing as well? For we pray this in Christ, our Savior's name.